Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a plenary uh, talk session. Uh, I'm Tetsuo Sawaragi from Kyoto University. Uh, it's a great honor of me uh, to chair of this plenary uh, talk session. Okay, so this is the third day, the middle uh, of the conference. And uh, maybe I wish you were enjoying the stay at Yokohama and uh, you're enjoying this conference. And I wish don't escape from the venue. <laughs> okay, so it is a time, it's the midst of the conference, all right. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's a great honor to introduce uh, our plenary speaker, uh, Professor Eric Hornaga, okay? So uh, maybe you can see his, his uh, uh, information uh, from this uh, IFAC application and uh, uh, so let me uh, briefly introduce uh, Professor Eric Honaga. He is a visiting professor, uh, he is a professional fellow at uh, Macquarie University of Australia and a visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study at Technical University of Munich in Germany. He is also a professor emeritus uh, from Linköping University of Sweden and uh, uh, yes, uh, parish, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, minus parish, uh, parish tech in France, and the University of Southern Denmark. Okay, <clears throat> uh, he has published widely and uh, is the author uh, of uh, 29 books. Okay, including seven books on resilience uh, engineering as well as a large number of uh, papers and uh, book chapters. Eric has been president of the European Association of Cognitive Ergonomics and co-founder and a past chairperson of both the uh, Resilience Engineering Association and the Resilience, uh, and the Resilience Healthcare Society. Okay, okay here uh, I am uh, asking a favor of you. Uh, Professor Hornaga uh, actually suffered a stroke uh, in the recent past, uh, which caused him a loss of the ability uh, to move particular parts of the body. Uh, not only I, but also those who know him were quite surprised and worried uh, when we heard uh, this trouble. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to welcome him to this uh, perennial talk. And uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, being shown his strengths and being encouraged by his rehabilitation. Eric's niece, uh, Miss uh, Nana Heaven, uh, is kindly accompanying him today. Uh, since uh, he is still in the process of recovery, I would like her to uh, monitor him nearby uh, during his talk. Okay. I would appreciate if you could uh, understand that in advance, that uh, there will be a, a short break uh, when he has uh, finished uh, uh, half of his talk. Okay. And uh, uh, then we uh, resume his talk then, okay? So uh, I would like you to understand the situation and uh, I would like to uh, have your cooperation. Thank you. Okay, so could you please start, uh, Professor Hornaga? Okay, so please. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Today, I, I sh I, I'm going to talk about resilience engineering, but I'm going to do it indirectly by asking a question. Whether resilience is a qu quality or, quant or quantity. And uh, the reason for asking this question is that in science, we, we are used to putting, putting quantity higher than quality we have that from Lord Kelvin who said that you need, you need to be able to measure, measure, measure something to understand it. And I think that is sort of the, 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 the common way of thinking in science. 
And he said, qualitative knowledge is real, but quantitative knowledge is always better. He was a great ph physicist, but he was a very bad philosopher because he's wrong. Qualitative knowledge is more important than quantita quantitative knowledge because if you don't know what something is, you cannot count it. So you need to know the quality before you can, can think about the quantity. So I think he was a physicist, he wasn't a philosopher, he wasn't a great thinker, obviously. That's why I want to ask a question whether resilience is, is a quality or a quantity. And uh, resilience came about over 19 years ago because the, a group of people were were unhappy with the way safety had developed. And, and we had a meeting in Sweden where we started to talk about resilience as an alternative to conventional safety. So the question is, do we understand what resilience is? And you can also ask, do we actually understand what safety is? Nobody, nobody asks that question because we always say safety, safety, safety. And nobody asks what safety actually is, but I think, I think it's very important to ask the question, what is it we're talking about, instead of just talking about it? So this is a group of people who started resilience 19 years ago. So next year is 20 years ago, and we are planning to have a small meeting to, to commemorate that in, in Lisbon, I think. So. You may not know all these people, but this, this is this guy here, Axel Anderson. He's not a scientist, but he was one of the people who sponsored the meeting. He's from the Swedish Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And this is David Woods, who came up with the, with the idea of resilience engineering. This is uh, Richard Cook who unfortunately has died. This is Andrew Hale. This is John Rethor, a practitioner of, of human reliability. This is Gunnar Sulstrup, who later became an economist in Deutsche Bank. This is Ron Westrom. This is uh, Rona Flynn from Aberdeen. This is René Amalberti from France. This is Arthur Dijkstra. He was a pilot at KLM. This is Sidney Dega, some of you may know, know him. This is Nick McDonald. This is Vin Dang. This is me. This is Yushi, Yushi Fujita, who helped us a lot. This is Jean Paris, a French pilot and, and, and consultant. So these are the people who met in 2004 for about one week to, to, to talk about resilience. And it's interesting because we sent out, and we, we, knew, we knew you, these people, and we sent out an invitation and said, do you want to come to Sweden for one week and talk about resilience? We don't know what it is, and you don't know what it is. And they all said, yes, we, have, we are happy to, happy to come. And that's how it all started. And of course, one of the first questions that, that were asked afterwards is, how can you measure resilience? Because people, people are crazy about measuring. And the question is, can you actually measure resilience? And I think the answer, unfortunately, is no, you cannot measure it. So, and since resilience was a, a, an alternative to safety, you can ask the question, can we measure, measure safety? And again, the answer is no, we cannot measure, measure, measure safety. So what do we measure when you measure safety? You measure, you count the number of accidents, which is actually not the, it's the absence of safety rather than the presence of safety. So you never measure safety, you only measure the lack of safety. And we do, of course, we don't want to measure the lack of resilience, we want, want to look at resilience as something that is not, not as something that isn't. So I think that was the analogy. And while I'm talking, I, I, I'd like you to think about I'm sure you're, you're curious about resilience, otherwise you wouldn't be here now. But think about what, what you would really like to ask. Just one question, the most important question for you about what resilience may, might be. And I, I won't promise that I can answer it, but I'll give it a try anyway.
when we come to the end. What? So I'll, I'll just break a short while to, to rest my voice a little, so. Okay, so thank you very much. Please take a break, <laughs> okay. So uh, here now, uh, asking you, all of you, about the question, about uh, how to measure the safety, okay. Yes, uh, I have ever heard his lecture so far, and he has stressed uh, the importance of the distinction between safety one and safety two, okay? So safety one is how to avoid the trouble or, or harms. Uh, but uh, this measure is uh, uh, how many uh, accidents happened or uh, how many uh, harmful events uh, occurred. So this kind of measure, uh, is it reflecting the actual safety? Uh, he, he did not accept this. And he has also proposed another measure for the safety. So he insisted that the safety should be uh, counted as a uh, dynamic non-event. Uh, nothing uh, anomalous should uh, happen, okay? And, uh, but it's quite uh, difficult how to measure this kind of safety, okay? Uh, because this is a non-event. We cannot observe uh, the usual uh, or the uh, normal state. And now he is proposing the safety too, okay? Uh, so he is insisting of the uh, positive part of the safety. And he sh is now uh, pro proposing uh, the safety should be measured by counting how many times the uh, outcome uh, the good, better outcome has been acquired, okay? So uh, this idea is very important for us to think about the safety. And uh, now he is uh, showing us how uh, the safety should be measured and uh, uh, quantity or quality, which is important for discuss about the safety or resilience, okay? So is it okay for you to restart the talk, okay? All right, so please. Good, good. Thank you for the, for the explanation. I, I didn't say much about safety one and safety two, but that is one of the consequences of resilience engineering. This is actually an idea that is in, in resilience engineering, but it was only formulated later, much later, after we had had time to think about it. And as you say, the important difference is that classical safety, the purpose of that is to prevent that things go wrong, but whereas in safety two, the purpose is to make sure that things go well. So it's the, it's the opposite of safety one. This also means that in safety one, the, the, the tradition is to learn from accidents, whereas in safety two, the, the, the message is we should learn from what goes well and become better at what goes well. We should try and understand why things go well, because most things actually go well and we can learn, learn from that. And it's more interesting to make sure that things go well than to prevent accidents. Preventing accidents is a cost, but making sure that things go well creates revenue and it's productive. That, that's one, one important consequence. Of, and I think that's a consequence also of, of resilience, resilience engineering. And when we had the first meetings, we had the first con conference in 2011 actually. Then we had some, some two, two typical reactions. One was this, that I know what engineering is, but what, what do you mean by resilience? And the other reaction was, I know what resilience is, is, but what do you mean by engineering? And there was a lot of discussion about that at the first meetings, and I think there's still some discussion about it. But, but my answer to that is read the books because as it was mentioned, there are a number of books about resilience engineering, and you have them here. The first one came in 2006, right after the first meeting, and then there have been books coming, but, but with greater and greater intervals. And as you, as you can see, some of them have been translated into Korean and Japanese, and one of them also into Spanish. So I think it's been quite, quite a success. I don't think we're planning any more books right now. I think we're planning a 
maybe a book to commemorate the 20 years of Brazilian engineering. So we we'll are working on that, and that, that would be interesting to see what people think now, 20 years later. But coming back to the issue of what, what is resilience? We, we already in the first book, uh, the first meeting, we said that resilience is not something a system has, it's something that, that it does. It's not something you can measure, you, you cannot quantify it. Resilience is a quality of performance. It's not the quality of a system. It's not measurable as such, but it's, it's a characteristic way of, of functioning. And this is the def definition of what resilience is. It's the ability to function as required under both expected and unexpected conditions. And the unexpected conditions are, are changes and disturbances, but also opportunities. That's very important. It's not only reaction to danger, but it's also being able to use opportunities because if a system cannot use opportunities, then it's not going to be very, very successful. So that's, that's the, that was the definition that we came up with in 2006. And later then we have realized that, that in order to do this, to function as required, you need, you need four potentials or four abilities. You need the potential to respond, the potential to monitor the potential to learn and the potential to anticipate. So you can say this is somehow the essence of what resilience is. And why do you need these four? Because if you are unable to respond, a system that's unable to respond is going to die like, like dinosaurs. And uh, if you are unable to monitor, then everything that happens is, is a surprise which is not very good. You cannot be constantly surprised. You should be ready when, when things happen. So monitoring is looking at the current situation. Anticipating is looking further ahead, what happens in the future. And learning is, of course, important, because if you don't learn, then you always res respond in the same way. And if you always respond in the same way, you cannot be successful. We know that from, from businesses and from everything else, you, you need, need to be able to learn and, and also in our private lives and adapt and adjust and learn not only from, from what goes wrong, but also learn from what goes well. We need to learn from failures and from successes at the same time. It's very important. That's the difference from safety. Safety says we need to learn from accidents. Resilience says we need to learn from accidents and from what goes well. There is there's a white paper out that was issued last year by the Flight Safety Foundation, which is entitled Learning from, from All Operations. And that is, a, that is the message now. We need to learn from all operations, which means we need to change the way we learn and the way we, we analyze and the way that we describe and c categorize. And that's what happens in resilience engineering. So why, do I, why did I start by talking about quality and quantity? Because I think that, that's very important for, for, the, for the questions you ask about resilience and resilience engineering. Because you, if you assume that resilience is a quantity, then the question is how much resilience is there? If you assume that resilience is a quality, then the question is how do we provide resilience? How can we make sure that that the system is able to perform in, under all, all circumstances, and that's what we're interested in, of course. It's not how much that is, but it's how well you're able to do, do things. And that's why it's important to, to ask the right question, and that's why it's important to, to discuss whether resilience is a quality or a quantity. And if you want to know a little more about it, then 
That is another white paper. You can find it here. It's issued by Eurocontrol, which describes what we call the resilience potentials, the systemic potentials. And, and that white paper describes both, both the theory and a, and a practical method to do it. So you can down, download it. It's free. And so I recommend if you are, if you are interested, please take a look at it. And as I said before, you should, you should think about what question you want to ask. And now is the time to ask the question. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, he proposed uh, very key uh, questions and uh, important ideas. Uh, for the resilience, as for us Japanese, we had had experienced a very huge uh, East Japan earthquake in 2011. And after that, uh, we discussed about how to recover from this kind of huge uh, disruptions. Uh, at the time, yes, I heard the word of resilience so many times. Uh, but uh, Eric has already proposed the idea of resilience uh, quite uh, in advance to uh, such a, uh, our uh, earthquake. And uh, he has shown uh, the idea of resilience uh, for a very long time, and uh, as I told you, uh, he has so many books uh, written, okay? Okay, and uh, he has proposed uh, uh, about uh, resilience. Is it quality or quantity, okay? Yeah, uh, this is a similar discussion uh, which I introduced uh, before, uh, whether safety should be measured or counted, and how, okay? So uh, I think that uh, there are so many ideas, and uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, even at this uh, IFAC uh, World Congress 2023, is the first uh, plenary talk uh, by Anu from the MIT has uh, provided us uh, uh, energy grid uh, topics, and even at the time uh, the attack, the cyber attack. This will be a very uh, important uh, issue, and how to recover from this kind of unexpected uh, disruption. This will be uh, very important for the system engineer and the uh, automatic control engineers. And uh, uh, we are now facing uh, the importance of this uh, idea of resilience. Okay? So uh, I think that uh, uh, um, there is a much plenty of time <laughs> left. Uh, so I welcome you any questions uh, concerning with uh, his talk so far. And uh, of course, uh, you can come back to uh, his original 51 and 52. And also, uh, how should we think about resilience? And uh, so any questions can be accepted. And uh, do you have any questions or comment to his talk so far? Okay, Anna. <clears throat> uh, it's a pleasure, uh, Dr. Holingel, to, ha to listen to uh, you. I've uh, 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 read a lot about um, your contributions over the years, and it's, uh, it's very nice to, to see you here in person. And I think you raised some excellent questions in terms of these concepts about quality and quantity, and there is no question that we begin with quality, and as uh, the urgency of some of the questions that we're facing in the world right now becomes higher, we have to make those qualitative notions uh, into quantity. Um, one of the things that, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, we worry about in the context of power grids is, again, because of that urgency that there are more and more anomalies that the grid faces and therefore resilience, which we do understand is this uh, incredible ability to withstand a severe um, event, um, that we need to make that notion quantitative. So um, one, the, 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 in the engineering context, um, there is always, of course, a need to quantify, to come up with 
resilience metric, the definition of, met, uh, of uh, resilience, and how do we distinguish, say, resilience from robustness and so on. So there are so many systems, properties, stability, safety, robustness, and resilience. And my question to you, and I'm sorry about the long uh, preamble here, is do you think that those notions really make the, prop, the whole process of making a quality into a quantity more difficult? Or do you have some uh, thoughts on how do you interlink uh, these different properties of a large scale system, like robustness, like stability, and like resilience? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good questions. So can I ask to answer to? My lungs, first one. Well, you mentioned some other concepts like robustness, and particularly in the beginning, there was a lot of discussion about is resilience different from robustness, and it was very often defined as a contrast to like brittleness. But I don't don't think you can define something as a contrast to something; you must define it by itself. And that's what I tried to do in the definition I showed you before. So we, we focused on performance, and, and the characteristic way of performing is what we call resilient performance. So I didn't say that clearly enough, but I think I see a change in, in the use of the word. Resilience is not a noun, it's an adverb. So we should talk about resilient and not resilience. And I think that that's a, that's a very important change because if you use it as a noun, then you think it's quantifiable. If it's an adverb, then it's clearly not quantifiable. But I think it is an adverb because it characterizes how something is done. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your question. And uh, she's asking about What's the difference between the resilience and the uh, uh, robustness? Yes, we control people are quite familiar with robustness. And we often discuss about how this idea is different from the robustness, okay? At the time, we often discuss that uh, robustness is like a steel, very rigid. <laughs> On the other hand, resilience is a kind of more flexible, uh, Yes, as I told you, so uh, he, Eric, has proposed how to measure the safety. It should be counted as a number of uh, acceptable outcomes, okay? Uh, which means that it's not usually behave as we assumed, uh, but uh, it should, uh, how to say, uh, a variation of the performance should be uh, accepted. But uh, the important thing is how these outcomes should be acceptable or not, and when it will exceed the boundary of the safety and the unsafe. Okay? So I think uh, this resilience idea is, uh, how to say, like a very flexible um, idea. Maybe for us Japanese, it is quite uh, uh, familiar with this idea because uh, we often uh, put in a metaphor of this uh, flexibility as a, a very tiny plant, okay? This tiny plant is a piling of snow is on the uh, plant, but this plant will be bending, okay? Uh, being, having this kind of uh, much snow. But uh, at some time, it will come back and uh, the pile will be uh, uh, say, released, okay? And the uh, plant itself will be alive, okay? This kind of uh, flexibility and uh, not uh, going to a uh, fatal status, but how to maintain a continue uh, such a, a acceptable uh, state will be a very important issue for the resilience. 
And uh, uh, from this perspective, uh, we can share much with a common uh, idea between the stable stability of the control theory and how uh, this kind of resilience and uh, related with each other. And especially for the society or community in which the human is included, uh, such a discussion on how the system itself will be flexible enough or uh, this will be a very important, and we Japanese have experienced this uh, much after 2011. Okay, okay so uh, Eric, will you, are you going to add some more comments on this question? Is it okay to ask the next one? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, is there any questions, uh, comments? Yes, sure, yep. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting talk. So I have a short, quick question. So if we need to use resilience instead of resilience, so from scientific perspective, can you make a comment on how can I say the system is more resilient than before? if it is not quantifiable. Thank you. <coughs> well, I think when you ask the question more resilient, then you sort of imply that it's measurable in some sense. And that's what I try to say, it isn't measurable, but if you talk about resilience as a quality of, of performance, of course you can, you can, you can co compare two performances and see if two systems perform equally well or if one performs better than, than the other in certain, situ certain situations. As I said, resilience is the ability to perform as required under expected and unexpected conditions, both. And you can always determine whether your system performs as it was supposed to do and that, that sense you can, can compare two, two systems to see if they do equally well, or if one does better than the other. When, when, for instance, under a difficult, in a, in a difficult situation under, with, with, uh, with lots of disturbances, whether it works well or whether, whether it breaks down when there are many disturbances. So I think you can, you can, can if you, I think I would look at it from, from a performance point of view because you can always evaluate the quality of the performance. Uh, so even if, you can, even if you don't measure performance directly, uh, you can make a judgment of, of the performance. Uh, okay, so, uh, so quickly wrap up. So if I understand correctly, you mean that the concept of resilience so is not quantifiable, but we, if we focus on a, spe so spe a particular aspect of resilience, so related to some performance, so we can see whether the system is more f uh, resilient from that perspective. Am I understanding correctly? I think the essence of, of resilience is the ability to perform as you should, should perform, as you were designed to perform. Okay. And Thank that you. is something you can assess. You, can, you cannot measure it, but you can assi assess it. And assessment is different from measurement. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions and comments? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. This. <coughs> I hope I'm still a little fast more. Thank you very much for your talk. And my question, or maybe comments, is uh, related to the theory of Jens Rasmussen, who is a researcher from the same domain as yours, I guess. And to my knowledge, he once uh, suggested that we have a qualitative model of uh, current situation or tasks we are facing. And uh, in that sense, uh, our process of the thinking is a kind of a uh, qualitative process. And uh, yeah, I found that your talk is uh, uh, something related to this point, and I came to think that uh, resilience is therefore something to represent or uh, yeah, represent or show as a kind of model 
rather than measuring. So uh, what my question is, uh, uh, my comment is, uh, I'd like you to, yeah, I, I would be glad if you could provide some comments or ideas and on this point and the, correct, correct me if I'm saying something wrong or strange. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, he's now asking about uh, the resilience in terms of the kind of model, okay? So uh, maybe some mental model, uh, which is very important for uh, think about the resilience. And he has uh, proposed the four potentials, uh, learning, estimating, and responding, and uh, I forgot one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe these uh, potentials are needed to based on some model. Okay, he's asking about what model is needed. Mm -hmm. Is this a numerical model or not? Okay, uh, maybe it's more a qualitative model, uh, like uh, uh, Professor Rasmussen has proposed in the past. Uh, he has the importance of such a mental model, uh, which is uh, very important for the uh, plant operator's uh, uh, information processing, and how the operator has the figure of the plant uh, in the brain, and how it manipulate this kind of models uh, to make a response, and so. So he is now asking about these issues. So Eric, can you give us some comments or answers? <coughs> There's one comment on that is that when we use the term model, we usually think about components or elements, the physical structure, and how components fit together. When I talk about models, I think about functions and how functions fit together, because that's more, more important for resilience, how something works, how something functions. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, a model should be a functional model and not a component model. And uh, most engineering models are models of components and how that's something we have from, from, the, from classical Greece. The, the decomposition principle, you know, from, from democracies that leads to the idea of the atom, the indivisible, that we, we divide things into, into elements, into parts, and see how these parts fit together, and that's how we model normally. Mm -hmm. But I think a model should, should be a model of, of function, of performance, which means we need a different language to model with, a different way of thinking about models. Okay, thank you very much. And let me add one very quick question. Does the model depend on the, the structure of model or model itself depend on the specific situation or context? Yes, of course it depends on the context because if it's a model of functioning, functioning is always, take, always takes place in a context and you need to, because the context affects the way the functions can be carried out. It provides the conditions for the functions. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to understand that and analyze that and model that. Okay, thank you very much. Arigatouzaimashita. Okay, thank you very much for your question. And related to this, uh, Eric, you mentioned in your talk uh, that uh, uh, resilience is uh, Mm, noun or adverse. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, if resilience is regarded as a noun, so it can be counted, okay? And if the resilience is regarded as something like an adver uh, adverbs or verb related uh, uh, concept, it is uh, like a, a verb, how to do it, okay? And uh, I think that uh, this is a qualitative uh, oriented ideas. And uh, maybe there is no topic uh, presented today, but we know that, Eric, you have uh, uh, developed a very interesting uh, representation scheme of FRAM, okay? A functional resonance uh, accident model, okay? So we uh, uh, very like this uh, idea. 
Uh, I think we think that uh, this is a kind of mental model uh, which were uh, sh to be shared by, within the organization and uh, not only represent uh, such uh, interrelations among the uh, functional component of the target system, but also how the individual component should behave, uh, fluctuate it, uh, in reply to the external uh, disruptions. Okay. Uh, I think that kind of model uh, from is uh, actually representing the verb level or functional level model. It's quite different from our familiar numerical model, but uh, uh, due to this reason, I think the universality and uh, uh, very usefulness of this kind of uh, functional uh, representation. And it's a very good for uh, the community uh, to share among uh, the status of our organizations, uh, resilient uh, status. And uh, so I like uh, this kind of uh, uh, simulating or envisioning a tool uh, which will uh, which can produce so many variety of uh, uh, evolutional behaviors of the system. Okay? So we can count up what is the acceptable outcome uh, can be expected. So I think this uh, uh, kind of model is very quite related to your uh, discussion on qualitative or quality uh, of the resilience rather than the quantity of the resilience. So uh, we are very glad if you add some comments on how you are uh, thinking about such an uh, expansion of the FRAM model and uh, how it can contribute to the resilience analysis, et cetera. Is it okay? You understand my questions? Yes, so thank you for your comment, but I, I, I'm sorry, but I have to make a small correction mm -hmm. because FRAM means functional resonance Analysis method, it's not a model, it's a method, method, method to develop a model. It's, it, it doesn't contain a model, it's just the principles of how, how do you build a model. And I think that's very important because most other method, methods that we use hide a model inside them, but Fram does not. Fram is, Fram is a pure method to use to build models, what we call functional models. I think it, it's, it's, it's uh, used more and more <coughs> because people find there's a need to build a functional model to understand how things happen. I know there have been some, in, in Korea, there have been some attempts during COVID-19 to build models of, of how Korea as, as a society coped with COVID-19, the whole health system, the whole official system because we need to understand that because it's a very complex kind of performance and we need to be able to analyze it to improve it and that's that's where we need models we need models of functions and not not of structures and that's what fram can do okay yep thank you very much how is the questions from the audience? Okay, yeah, please. <coughs> Thank you very much for a wonderful speech. And uh, <coughs> you propose the uh, revolutionary uh, principle of uh, equivalence of success and uh, failure uh, in the past. And uh, that was against the traditional understanding of the uh, safety. Uh, so traditionally, safety was a uh, uh, function, uh, was thought as a function of a uh, failure, but uh, you propose that. Uh, you, can o you can also say that uh, safety is also the function of success. So. Uh, can we uh, apply this kind of uh, equivalence principle to uh, quality and a quantity uh, topic? Uh, 
the quality, uh, traditionally, uh, quantity gives us the rationale of the uh, qualitative statement. That was uh, the reason why qu quantity is very important, because it gives us rationale for our qualitative statement. But at the same time, as we can use FRAM modeling, uh, all the uh, numbers and the uh, uh, happenings or things or functioning gives, uh, uh, will uh, get the uh, qualitative understanding statement or a qualitative rationale for all these numbers and the relationship of those numbers. So uh, the quality and the quantity uh, has a relationship as a safety, uh, no, 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 uh, success or failure. It gives uh, gives uh, each each of them as a rationale or understanding pretty well. So uh, can we say that the uh, quantity and the quality has a principle of uh, equivalence? I think we are so in interested in, in quantity because we think it's easier to compare two things if you have the numbers. We know that four is more than three. So if you can quantify something, it's much easier to compare. And I think because we all, as human beings, we are very lazy. We want to do it as, as easily as possible. Hmm. So we try to find the easy solution and then we apply that and then we, we forget to think about what we're actually doing. But I think, as I said, quality precedes quantity because if I just give you a number and say 92, it doesn't mean anything. Numbers by themselves are, ab are absolutely meaningless. You need to know what they, re they refer to. 92 is a number, but what does it mean? If you say, say that this is relative to the birth weight of an elephant, mm -hmm. then of course it means something because we know how much an elephant weighs at birth on average. And you know whether, whether it's a very heavy mm -hmm. elephant or a very small elephant. Mm -hmm. But without, without that qualification, the number is completely meaningless. So it's so easy to come up with numbers. And I know, I know that because I suffer from hay fever. So every year in Denmark, we have numbers that says the number of pollen, of certain types of pollen, and we have the heavy in, in the radio in the morning. <clears throat> but unless I know exactly what it means, it's a meaningless number for me to say that the pollen count is 11.8. I need, need to know more exact, exactly what it is. Otherwise, it's just a number, and it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. yeah, I may know it's, it's larger than yesterday, mm -hmm. but, but uh, I need to know exactly what it is before I can use the number. So I think we should think more about quality and less about quantity. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, so any other questions, comments? Okay. Okay, let me ask the final question. Okay, so in your, uh, the end of the slide, you show us uh, the four potentials needed for uh, the resilience. Okay, run, respond, anticipate, and monitor. Okay, 
these four potentials are quite important, and it's a quite a universal, a universally important uh, potentials for us. Uh, my question is, how can we evaluate uh, with these, uh, each of the aspects? For instance, how our organization is resilient. So at that time, what kind of means, uh, what kind of method is uh, available uh, to evaluate the level of the resilience uh, in some particular uh, organization? or in some particular community or society. So do you have some ideas how to uh, access to this uh, four potentials of the resilience? This is my and our final questions. As I mentioned, we have this, this white paper from Jürgen Toll, which actually des describes the theory behind the four potentials and also a method how to, I shouldn't say measure them, because I'm, but a method to assess them so you can use it systematically to know how well you're doing with regard to the four potentials. <coughs> it's not the same as measuring you need to assess the situation to know how well you're doing, and, and we have developed a method for doing that, which is described in the white paper I showed you before. I can try and go back to it. This is the one, you can find it there. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I like this keyword of systemic. This is very important. It's a bit different from the systematic. So I like the systemic ideas very much. Yeah. Anyway, it's time to close the session. And uh, thank you very much, Eric, in spite of your physical conditions. And uh, you are now recovering from the stroke. And uh, I think that uh, the healthy condition is quite similar to the safety. That is, uh, we are apt to evaluate our healthy condition by counting up what ability I lost and what I cannot do this. But his idea on the safety, especially the idea of the safety too, we should uh, turn our perspective towards much more positive issues. How much ability I can do and what uh, behavior I can perform. So this kind of uh, uh, ideas is very important uh, to think about the safety, to think about the resilience, and think about our personal health condition. Okay, okay so thank you very much, Eric. And uh, I would like to appreciate your coming to Japan and give us a talk. Thank you.